so that's me. Uh, my name is Ellen. Uh, I'm a filmmaker, uh, mostly a cinematographer, which makes me um, a very rare species because uh, in the feature film filmmaking world, there is less than 4% of female cinematographers. So um, uh, this has maybe also formed uh, me as a teacher, definitely formed me as a cinematographer. And uh, maybe partly also is uh, responsible for the fact that I am teaching. I never really saw myself uh, as a teacher, but because I come from a long line of uh, university professors, uh, once I found myself in front of the audience, I understood that uh, I have been trying to escape this for my whole life, but it caught up with me. So here I am standing again. Um, I'm an associate professor in BFM and very, very info important information about me is that I am a student of Tallinn Driving School from 2015 to 2019. <laughs> this is extremely important fact because I was already uh, a mid-level manager in, uh, in the university when I started learning driving. And I think it made me a better teacher possibly also made me a better parent and maybe even better human because when you sit in the middle of um, traffic and uh, somebody is screaming at you, why did you do this? You realize that you don't even know what you did, let alone trying to explain why you did it. So it was a very humbling experience to start learning in an age where I thought that uh, I have managed to somehow uh, bluff myself through the education system and I don't have to uh, show how stupid I am. Um, it was also interesting because um, it uh, reconfirmed the many things that I have experienced as a teacher. Uh, I teach uh, filmmaking and it is a, a creative field which means that uh, creative thinking or how to support creative thinking is one of the the most basic and most important um, things that uh, I needed to discover. When I started to teach, I didn't know anything about teaching. I had been a very, very bad student. I think I spent my high school uh, mostly learning how to uh, make notes on very small papers <laughs> and hide them in different places. I was very good at this, but the rest kind of escaped me. Uh, by now I have a PhD, but I also have ADHD, so uh, this makes me maybe a little bit uh, out of the box person in everywhere I go. So in the structures of the, this educational system, I don't fit very well, um, but also uh, filmmaking is interesting. I find it curious, it's invigorating, but uh, it does not fulfill my need to understand. One of the things that I realized uh, when I was, um, when I had graduated high school and the struggles that I had in high school was that uh, at some point I realized that I am unable to memorize anything which I don't understand. And in schools we are made to memorize many, many things which we don't understand. And maybe being an uncomfortable student uh, was uh, my way of uh, just uh, not really understanding what, what, what was expected of me. And then when I started teaching, I came to BFM, our film school, to teach after uh, my professor, Yuri Sillard, passed away. Suddenly I felt uh, an ob obligation, a moral obligation towards him. Uh, so I came out of a sense of mission. I didn't come out of a sense of being a driven teacher. I, I felt that I need to do something, but my background wasn't really there, so I had to learn very, very quickly. And one of the things that maybe surprised me was that uh, we tend to think that teaching means, that, or learning means that you say something and then the other person receives this. And that's how we learn. But it's not how we learn. Very, very often, we really, in, even in conversations, we really don't listen to other people. We just wait for our line to talk. And in schools, uh, very, very often, uh, teachers who have shown 
some information on slides, they kind of tick this box, okay, this information is there, it's already in the brains of the audience, which it's not. And uh, my teaching is all uh, concerned about um, practice-based uh, learning, because filmmakers learn only through practice. If I would squeeze uh, the things that you need to know to be a filmmaker into one slideshow, I think it would be like two hours max. It's not four years, but we teach them for four years. The reason we teach them for four years is they learn through exposure, they don't learn through slides. So, and this is one of the things that, uh, that prompted me to uh, rebuild our whole curriculum. So everything I speak to you today about this is a personal reflection about learning, uh, about learning um, that I uh, had as a learner myself, that I had as a learner in the driving school, and also that I have as a teacher and partly responsible of, the, of rearranging a curriculum which has been um, currently this uh, reform that we did. I think uh, we can consider it quite uh, successful because uh, the first um, fully reformed curriculum, um, the, one of the final films won Student Film Oscar. So for me it was kind of something that showed that maybe I did something right. Or maybe it was an accident. We never know if we become who we become thanks to the school or despite of the school. So, but what I want to, to, uh, what I want to talk to you today about is mostly uh, about the creative thinking and uh, about the importance of creative thinking in all the fields, not only these kind of fields that we tend to consider creative. And one of the things that uh, in, uh, in uh, my life as a, as a learner I met a lot was this word talent. So in art schools very much we hear about if you are talented or if you're not. I, I wasn't, so I was in a conundrum. If I'm not, I, I started uh, studying cinematography, but I was uh, very verbal, I wasn't visual. So I sensed uh, throughout my studies that I am not talented. And I was um, kind of stuck with this, uh, trying to understand what, what am I to do if I don't have this thing that they are talking about that you should have. And I kind of had, this, this word started annoying me and uh, I saw so many students struggling with this understanding that are you talented or not? And I became curious about this word, the etymology of this uh, word talent. And uh, in this uh, Proto-Indo-European uh, synthetic language, uh, the core of talent is telch. In Latin it's tolero. It comes from the same root as the word tolerate comes. For me, this was a very, very important understanding. Talent is not somebody who suddenly received something in their birth that they didn't fight for. Talent is somebody who doesn't give up. Somebody who struggles, figures out how to get through this struggle, continues, struggles again, figures out how to get through this uh, struggle, and at some point people will say, wow, you're so talented. But talent uh, is a mixture of m very many things, of endurance, of uh, not giving up, of being able to leave your own ego somewhere aside and to keep on learning, that we usually see the tip of the iceberg of this talent. But really underneath is the word tolerate. So the person who is able to not give up at some point will be very, very talented, if not in anything else, very talented in trying. So another thing that uh, I want to really, really uh, focus on is the understanding of creative thinking. Because creative thinking, I've been now um, um, speaking in different meetings and conferences where usually I, I see people from art schools uh, and I, I feel that uh, there is this kind of notion that there is this serious thinking and then there is that vocational kind of like creative stuff uh, that can be connected to handicraft and maybe some painting, but this is all kind of a hobby thing. But we have this serious thinking that we kind of learn in schools, we look at slides, and we look at uh, Excel sheets, and this is the serious kind of thinking. And the other kind of thinking, the creative kind of thinking, is kind of like where you rest. I, I have a big opposition against this idea. I think creative thinking is the utmost fundamental question of humanity at this point. 
And why I think this is that, uh, firstly, I would like to, maybe some of you know, because it's uh, actually more your field than mine, but um, so if you know it, uh, just remember the importance of uh, uh, George Lund's uh, creativity test. So uh, years ago, uh, NASA uh, ordered uh, George Lund, asked from George Lund to create a test that uh, could uh, allow them to find the most creative thinking engineers so that they could assign the biggest problems that NASA was facing, the biggest engineering problems, to the most creative thinking engineers. So creative thinking is not only a concern of art schools, it's a concern of, I would say, NASA is the most high-tech thing that humanity has. They are also concerned about finding the most creative thinkers. So in their, um, in their uh, human resources system, they were trying to figure out where to assign people. And uh, George Lund created this test NASA was very happy with this. The results were incredible. Uh, I don't know if they still use it, but, but it was a successful test. So he became curious. He wanted to know, OK, so uh, how does this creativity show up in, um, in regular humans, not NASA humans? And um, so the creative test, uh, when you pass it, let's say, somewhere around the score 100, or 95 plus, you're considered creative genius. So somebody who completely thinks outside of the box, somebody who is able to create new connections between ideas that haven't been made before. So more than 300,000 uh, people passed this test, and the results were baffling. So as you can see here, 5%, uh, oh, sorry, 98% of five-year-olds are creative geniuses. 2% of adults are creative geniuses. This is very, very, very big drop. So uh, this is us. <laughs> and this is my kid. He's in kindergarten, and his brain is completely being wasted there. If he could figure out the NASA problems, probably. And if we could be in kindergartens, maybe we would be much more creative. So it's easy. Um, it's, it's, it's a sad graph, but it's also, it, it also makes sense. So it's easy to blame school, because what happens during these years is schooling. So it's easy to say school kills creativity. At the same time, uh, schooling is not accidental in this, in this age. This is the age where people become socialized. When you become part of a society, then you, you start moderating your behavior. You start moderating your thinking. You're thinking more inside the box to fit and less outside of the box. So, so in a way, this is the age. Um, my dad, I'm going to cite him a lot because he's funny. My dad always says, schooling, schooling. Yeah, school, it's, it's just a long initiation right. Initiation rights everywhere in societies are, are embarrassing and unbearable. So we just have it 12 years of this. Um, Something, it, but, so I, we could say it's okay that the creativity, this uh, thinking out of the box uh, skill uh, lessens over the lifespan. But I would say this drop is a little bit too dramatic. Think about if we would have, if instead of this 2%, we could still maintain 10%. Most of humanity's issues would be solved by now. These creative thinkers who are able to make new connections to see potential where other people don't see, this is a lost potential. And uh, what I believe strongly is uh, from here, we can move the other way. We can turn the tide because I have to do it with my students. My students, they come from a high school uh, mostly. I also teach MA and PhD level, but uh, my, my BA students, most of them come from high school. Some of them have lived life in between, but they come in this understanding that you need, to be, you need to kind of do things that need to be done in the educational system so you learn. And I need to break the box around their heads. And I usually take, it usually takes one year to break this box. And it, it takes very, very long time and they still continue. But understanding that uh, creative thinking is a skill uh, that can be trained is something that takes time. So uh, I do see that there is an immense potential that uh, especially um, why I, I think it's very important in your fields is that adult learning 
in a way has the potential to change this tide because kids, they are creative. And of course, as I said, it makes sense. If you're two years old, then, I don't know, painting with your poop on the wall is very creative. If you're an adult, then you need to be a world famous artist uh, to be considered creative. Otherwise, you're, you're going to need help. So it makes sense that some of the in the box thinking we need. If everybody in this room would be thinking completely outside of the box, I don't think uh, any of you, for example, would be listening to me. You would have so much more interesting things to do. So we do need to have some of the boxes around our heads, but um, I believe that this change is too dramatic, and I think there is a potential that uh, can be unleashed uh, within the adult teaching and learning sector. So more about creative thinking. I want to borrow some words from a person who is much more funny than me, John Cleese. You know, when uh, Video Arts asked me if I'd like to talk about creativity, I said, no problem, no problem, because telling people how to be creative is easy. It's only being it that's difficult. And I knew it would be particularly easy for me because I spent the last 25 years watching how various creative people produce their stuff and being fascinated to see if I could figure out what makes folk, including me, more creative. What is more, a couple of years ago, I got very excited because a friend of mine who runs the psychology department at Sussex University, Brian Bates, showed me some research on creativity done at Berkeley in the 70s by a brilliant psychologist called Donald McKinnon, which seemed to confirm in the most impressively scientific way all the vague observations and intuitions that I'd had over the years. So the prospect of settling down to a quite serious study of creativity for the purpose of tonight's gossip was delightful. And having spent several weeks on it, I can state categorically that what I have to tell you tonight about what, how you can all become more creative is a complete waste of time. <laughs> so I think it would be much better if I just told jokes instead. You know the light bulb jokes, you know? How many poles does it take to screw in a light bulb? One to hold the bulb, four to turn the table. Um, how many folk singers does it take to change a light bulb? Answer five, one to change the bulb, and four to sing about how much better the old one was. <laughs> how many socialists does it take to change a light bulb? Answer, we're not going to change it, we think it works. How many creative art? You see, the reason why it is futile for me to talk about creativity is that it simply cannot be explained. It's like Mozart's music or Van Gogh's painting or Saddam Hussein's propaganda. It is literally inexplicable. <laughs> Freud, who analyzed practically everything else, repeatedly denied that psychoanalysis could shed any light whatsoever on the mysteries of creativity. And Brian Bates wrote to me recently, most of the best research on creativity was done in the 60s and 70s with a quite dramatic drop off in quantity after then, largely I suspect because researchers began to feel that they had reached the limits of what science could discover about it. In fact, the only thing from the research that I could tell you about how to be creative is the sort of childhood that you should have had, which is of limited help to you at this point of your lives. <laughs> However, there is one negative thing that I can say. And it's negative because it's easier to say what creativity isn't. Uh, a bit like the sculptor who, when asked how he had sculpted a very fine elephant, explained that he'd taken a big block of marble and then knocked away all the bits that didn't look like an elephant. <laughs> now, here's the negative thing. Creativity is not a talent. It is not a talent. It is a way of operating. So, 
How many actors does it take to screw in a light bulb? <laughs> Answer, thousands, only one to do it, but thousands to say, I could have done that. <laughs> How many Jewish mothers does it take to screw in a light bulb? Answer, don't mind me, I'll just sit here in the dark, nobody cares about me. <laughs> How many surgeons? You see, when I say a way of operating, what I mean is this. Creativity is not an ability that you either have or do not have. It is, for example, and this may surprise you, absolutely unrelated to IQ. Provided you're intelligent above a certain minimal level, that is. But McKinnon showed in investigating scientists, architects, engineers, and writers, that those regarded by their peers as most creative were in no way whatsoever different in IQ from their less creative colleagues. So in what way were they different? Well, McKinnon showed that the most creative had simply acquired a facility for getting themselves into a particular mood, a way of operating, which allowed their natural creativity to function. In fact, Kinnan, McKinnon described this particular facility as an ability to play. Indeed, he described the most creative when in this mood as being childlike. For they were able to play with ideas, to explore them, not for any immediate practical purpose, but just for enjoyment. Play for its own sake. Now, about this mood, I'm working at the moment with Dr. Robin Skinner on a successor to our psychiatry book, Families and How to Survive Them. We're comparing the ways in which psychologically healthy families function and then the ways in which such families function with the ways in which the most successful corporations and organizations function. And we become fascinated by the fact that we can usefully describe the way in which people function at work in terms of two modes, open and closed. So what I can just add now is that creativity is not possible in the closed mode, okay? So how many American network TV executives does it take to screw in a light bulb? Answer, does it have to be a light bulb? <laughs> how many doorkeepers? Well, let me explain a little more. By the closed mode, I mean the mode that we are in most of the time when we're at work. We have inside us a feeling that there's lots to be done, and we have to get on with it if we're going to get through it all. It's an active, probably slightly anxious mode, although the anxiety can be exciting and pleasurable. It's a mode in which we're probably a little impatient, if only with ourselves. It has a little tension in it, not much humor. It's a mode in which we're very purposeful and it's a mode in which we can get very stressed and even a bit manic, but not creative. By contrast, the open mode is, is a relaxed, expansive, less purposeful mode in which we're probably more contemplative, uh, more inclined to humor, which always accompanies a wider perspective, and consequently, more playful. It's a mood in which curiosity for its own sake can operate, because we're not under pressure to get a specific thing done quickly. We can play, and that is what allows our natural creativity to surface. Now, let me give you an example of what I mean. When Alexander Fleming had the thought that led to the discovery of penicillin, he must have been in the open mode. The previous day, he'd arranged a number of dishes so that culture would grow upon them. On the day in question, he glanced at the dishes and he discovered that on one of them, no culture had appeared. Now, if he'd been in the closed mode, he would have been so focused upon his need for dishes with cultures grown upon them that when he saw that one dish was of no use to him for that purpose, he would quite simply have thrown it away. But thank goodness he was in the open mode, so he became curious about why the culture had not grown on this particular dish. And that curiosity, as the world knows, led him to the light bulb. I'm sorry, to, to, to penicillin. 
Now, in the closed mode, an uncultured dish is an irrelevance. In the open mode, it's a clue. Now, one more example. One of Alfred Hitchcock's regular co-writers has described working with him on screenplays. He says, when we came up against a block and our discussions became very heated and intense, Hitchcock would suddenly stop and tell a story that had nothing to do with the work at hand. At first, I was almost outraged. And then I discovered that he did this intentionally. He mistrusted working under pressure. He would say, we're pressing, we're pressing. We're working too hard. Relax, it will come. And, says the writer, of course, it finally always did. But let me make one thing quite clear. We need to be in the open mode when we're pondering a problem. But once we come up with a solution, we must then switch to the closed mode to implement it. Because once we've made a decision, we are efficient only if we go through with it decisively, undistracted by doubts about its correctness. For example, if you decide to leap a ravine, the moment just before takeoff is a bad time to start reviewing alternative strategies. <laughs> when you're attacking a machine gun post, you should not make a particular effort to see the funny side of what you're doing. <laughs> Humor is a natural concomitant of the open mode, but it's a luxury in the closed one. No, once we've taken a decision, we should narrow our focus while we're implementing it. And then after it's been carried out, we should once again switch back to the open mode to review the feedback arising from our action in order to decide whether the course that we have taken is successful or whether we should continue with the next stage of our plan. Whether we should create an alternative plan to correct any error we've perceived. And then, back into the closed mode again to implement that next stage, and so on. In other words, to be at our most efficient, we need to be able to switch backwards and forwards between the two modes. But here's the problem. We too often get stuck in the closed mode. Under the pressures which are all too familiar to us, we tend to maintain tunnel vision at times when we really need to step back and contemplate the wider view. This is particularly true, for example, of politicians. The main complaint about them from their non-political colleagues is that they become so addicted to the adrenaline that they get from reacting to events on an hour-by-hour -hour basis that they almost completely lose the desire or the ability to ponder problems in the open mode. So, as I say, creativity is not possible in the closed mode. And that's it. Well, 20 minutes to go, so how many women's livers does it take to change a light bulb? Answer, 37, one to screw it in, and 36 to make a documentary about it. <laughs> how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? The answer, only one, but the light bulb has really got to want to change. <laughs> oh, there is one just one other thing that I can say about creativity. There are certain conditions which do make it more likely that you'll get into the open mode and that something creative will occur, more likely. You can't guarantee anything will occur. You might sit around for hours, as I did last Tuesday, and nothing. Zilch, butt kiss, not a sausage. Nevertheless, I, I can at least tell you how to get yourselves into the open mode. You need five things. One, space. Two, time. Three, time. Four, confidence. And five, a 22-inch waist. Sorry, my mind was wandering. I'm <laughs> getting into the open mode too quickly. Instead of a 22-inch waist, read Humor, I do beg your pardon. Okay, let's take space first. You can't become playful and therefore creative if you're under your usual pressures, because to cope with them, you've got to be in the closed mode, right? So you have to create some space for yourself away from those demands. And that means sealing yourself off. 
You must make a quiet space for yourself where you will be undisturbed. Next, time. It's not enough to create space. You have to create your space for a specific period of time. You have to know that your space will last until exactly, say, 3.30, and that at that moment your normal life will start again. And it's only by having a specific moment when your space starts and an equally specific moment when your space stops that you can seal yourself off from the everyday closed mode in which we all habitually operate. And I'd never realized how vital this was until I read a historical study of play by a Dutch historian called Johan Huizinga. And in it he says, play is distinct from ordinary life, both as to locality and duration. This is its main characteristic, its secludedness, its limitedness. Play begins, and then at a certain moment, it is over. Otherwise, it's not play. So, combining the first two factors, we create an oasis of quiet for ourselves by setting boundaries of space and of time. Now, creativity can happen. Because play is possible when we're separate from everyday life. So, you've arranged to take no calls, you've closed your door, you've sat down somewhere comfortable, you've taken a couple of deep breaths, and if you're anything like me, after you've pondered some problem that you want to turn into an opportunity for about 90 seconds, you find yourself thinking, oh, I forgot I've, I've got to call Jim. Oh, and I must tell Tina that I need the report on Wednesday and not Thursday, which means I must move my lunch with Joe. And damn, I haven't called St. Paul's about getting Joe's daughter an interview. And I must pop out this afternoon to get Will's birthday present. And those plants need watering. And none of my pencils are sharpened. And right, I've got too much to do. So I'm going to start by sorting out my paper clips. And then I shall make 27 phone calls. And I'll do some thinking tomorrow when I've got everything out of the way. Because. As we all know, it's easier to do trivial things that are urgent than it is to do important things that are not urgent, like thinking. And it's also easier to do little things we know we can do than to start on big things that we're not so sure about. So, when I say create an oasis of quiet, know that when you have, your mind will pretty soon start racing again but you're not going to take that race seriously. You just sit there for a bit, tolerating the racing and the slight anxiety that comes with that. And after a time, your mind will quieten down again. Now, because it takes some time for your mind to quieten down, it's absolutely no use arranging a space-time oasis lasting 30 minutes, because just as you're getting quieter and getting into the open mode, you'll have to stop, and that is very deeply frustrating. So you must allow yourself a good chunk of time. I'd suggest about an hour and a half. Then after you've gotten to the open mode, you'll have about an hour left for something to happen, if you're lucky. But don't put a whole morning aside. My experience is that after about an hour and a half, you need a break. So it's far better to do an hour and a half now and then an hour and a half next Thursday and maybe an hour and a half a week after that than to fix one four and a half hour session now. And there's another reason for that. And that's factor number three. Time. Yes, I, I know we've just done time, but that was half of creating our oasis. Now I'm going to tell you about how to use the oasis that you've created. Why do you still need time? Well. Let me tell you a story. I was always intrigued that one of my Monty Python colleagues, who seemed to be, to me, more talented than I was, did never produce scripts as original as mine. And I watched for some time, and then I began to see why. If he was faced with a problem, and fairly soon saw a solution, he was inclined to take it. 
even though, I think, he knew the solution was not very original. Whereas if I was in the same situation, although I was sorely tempted to take the easy way out and finish by five o'clock, I just couldn't. I'd sit there with the problem for another hour and a quarter and by sticking at it would, in the end, almost always come up with something more original. It was that simple. My work was more creative than his simply because I was prepared to stick with the problem longer. So imagine my excitement when I found that this was exactly what McKinnon found in his research. He discovered that the most creative professionals always played with the problem for much longer before they tried to resolve it. Because they were prepared to tolerate that slight discomfort and anxiety that we all experience when we haven't solved a problem. You know what I mean? If we have a problem, and we, we need to solve it. Until we do, we feel inside us a kind of internal agitation, a tension or uncertainty that makes us just plain uncomfortable. And we want to get rid of that discomfort. So in order to do so, we take a decision. Not because we're sure it's the best decision, but because taking it will make us feel better. Well, the most creative people have learned to tolerate that discomfort for much longer. And so, just because they put in more pondering time, their solutions are more creative. Now, the people I find it hardest to be creative with are people who need, all the time, to project an image of themselves as decisive. And who feel that to create this image, they need to decide everything very quickly and with a great show of confidence. Well, this behavior, I suggest sincerely, is the most effective way of strangling creativity at birth. But please note, I'm not arguing against real decisiveness. I'm 100% in favor of taking a decision when it has to be taken, and then sticking to it while it's being implemented. What I'm suggesting to you is that before you take a decision, you should always ask yourself the question, when does this decision have to be taken? And having answered that, you defer the decision until then, in order to give yourself maximum pondering time, which will lead you to the most creative solution. And if, while you're pondering, somebody accuses you of indecision, say, look, baby cakes, I don't have to decide till Tuesday, and I'm not chickening out of my creative discomfort by taking a snap decision before then. That's too easy. So, to summarize, the third factor that facilitates creativity is time. Giving your mind as long as possible to come up with something original. Now, the next factor, number four, is confidence. When you're in your space-time oasis, getting into the open mode, nothing will stop you being creative so effectively as the fear of making a mistake. Now, if you think about play, you'll see why. True play is experiment. What happens if I do this? What would happen if we did that? What if? The very essence of playfulness is an openness to anything that may happen. A feeling that whatever happens, it's okay. So you cannot be playful if you're frightened that moving in some direction will be wrong. Something you shouldn't have done. I mean, you're either free to play or you're not. As Alan Watts puts it, you can't be spontaneous within reason. So, you've got to risk saying things that are silly and illogical and wrong. And the best way to get the confidence to do that is to know that while you're being creative, nothing is wrong. There's no such thing as a mistake, and any drivel may lead to the breakthrough. And now, the last fact, the fifth, humor. Well, I happen to think the main evolutionary significance of humor is that it gets us from the closed mode to the open mode quicker than anything else. 
I think we all know that laughter brings relaxation and that humour makes us playful, yet how many times have important discussions been held where really original and creative ideas were desperately needed to solve important problems, but where humour was taboo because the subject being discussed was so serious. This attitude seems to me to stem from a very basic misunderstanding of the difference between serious and solemn. Now, I suggest to you that a, a group of us could be sitting around after dinner discussing matters that were extremely serious, like the education of our children or our marriages or the, the meaning of life, and I'm not talking about the film, and we could be laughing, and that would not make what we were discussing one bit less serious. Solemnity, on the other hand, I mean, I don't know what it's for. I mean, what is the point of it? The two most beautiful memorial services that I've ever attended both had a lot of humor, and it somehow freed us all and made the services inspiring and cathartic. But solemnity, it serves pomposity, and the self-important always know at some, some level of their consciousness that their egotism is going to be punctured by humor. That's why they see it as a threat, and so dishonestly pretend that their deficiency makes their views more substantial when it only makes them feel bigger. <laughs> <laughs> no, humor is an essential part of spontaneity, an essential part of playfulness, an essential part of the creativity that we need to solve problems, no matter how serious they may be. So, when you set up a space-time oasis, giggle all you want. And there, ladies and gentlemen, are the five factors which you can arrange to make your lives more creative. Space, time, time, confidence, and Lord Geoffrey Archer. <laughs> so, now you know how to get into the open mode. The only other requirement is that you keep your mind gently round the subject you ponder. Your daydream, of course, but you just keep bringing your mind back, just like with meditation. Because, and this is the extraordinary thing about creativity, if you just keep your mind resting against the subject in a friendly but persistent way, sooner or later, you will get a reward from your unconscious. Probably in the shower later, or at breakfast the next morning, but suddenly you are rewarded. Out of the blue, a new thought mysteriously appears. If you've put in the pondering time first. So, how many Cecil Parkinson's does it take to change a light bulb? Answer two, one to screw it in, one to screw it up. How many... <laughs> How many account executives does it take to screw in a light bulb? Answer, can I get back to you on that? <laughs> how many Norwegian, oh, sorry, how many Yugoslav, how many Malt, how many Dutch, I'm out of jokes. Oh, one thing. Looking at you all reminds me, I think it's easy to be creative if you've got other people to play with. I always find that if two or more of us throw ideas backwards and forwards, I get to more interesting and original places than I could ever have got to on my own. But there is a danger, a real danger, if there's one person around you who makes you feel defensive, you lose the confidence to play and it's good by creativity. So always make sure your play friends are people that you like and trust. And never say anything to squash them either. Never say no or wrong or I don't like that. Always be positive and build on what's been said. Would it be even better if? I don't quite understand that. Can you just explain it again? Go on. What if? Let's pretend. Try to establish 
as free an atmosphere as possible. And you know, sometimes I wonder if the success of the Japanese isn't partly due to their instinctive understanding of how to use groups creatively. You know, Westerners are often amazed at the unstructured nature of Japanese meetings. But maybe it's just that very lack of structure, that absence of time pressure, that frees them to solve problems so creatively. And how clever of the Japanese sometimes to plan that unstructuredness by, for example, insisting that the first people to give their views are the most junior, so that they can speak freely without the possibility of contradicting what's already been said by somebody more important. Four minutes left. Ah, how many Irish... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, look, the very last thing that I can say about creativity is this. It's like humor. In a joke, the laugh comes at a moment when you connect two different frameworks of reference in a new way. Example, there's the old story about... Um, a woman doing a survey into sexual attitudes who stops an airline pilot and asks him, amongst other things, when he last had sexual intercourse. He replies, 1958. Now, knowing airline pilots, the researcher is surprised and queries this. Well, says the pilot, it's only 2110 now. <laughs> we laugh, eventually. At the moment, the moment of contact between two frameworks of reference, the way we express what year it is in the 24-hour clock. Now, having an idea, a new idea, is exactly the same thing. It's connecting two hitherto separate ideas in a way that generates new meaning. Now, connecting different ideas isn't difficult. You can connect cheese with motorcycles or moral courage with light green or bananas with international cooperation. You can get any computer to make a billion random connections for you. But these new connections or, or juxtapositions are significant only if they generate new meaning, right? So as you play, you can deliberately try inventing these random juxtapositions and then use your intuition to tell you whether any of them seem to have significance for you. That's the bit the computer can it can produce millions of new connections, but it can't tell which one of them smells interesting. And, of course, you'll produce some juxtapositions which are absolutely ridiculous. Absurd. Good for you. Because Edward de Bono, who invented the notion of lateral thinking, specifically suggests in his book uh, Poe, Beyond Yes and No, that you can try loosening up your assumptions by playing with deliberately crazy connections. He calls such absurd ideas intermediate impossibles. And he points out that the use of an intermediate impossible is completely contrary to ordinary logical thinking in which you have to be right at each stage. It doesn't matter if the intermediate impossible is right or absurd. It can nevertheless be used as a stepping stone to another idea that is right. Another example of how, uh, when you're playing, nothing is wrong. So, to summarize, if you really don't know how to start, or if you've got stuck, start generating random connections and allow your intuition to tell you if one might lead somewhere interesting. Well, that really is all I can tell you that won't help you to be creative, everything. And now, in the two minutes left, I can come to the important part, and that is how to stop your subordinates becoming creative too, which is the real threat. <laughs> because believe me, no one appreciates better than I do what trouble creative people are and how they stop decisive, hard-nosed bastards like us from running businesses efficiently. I mean, we all know we encourage someone to be creative. The next thing is they're rocking the boat, coming up with ideas and asking us questions. Now, if we don't nip this kind of thing in the bud, we'll have to start justifying our decisions by reasoned argument and sharing information, the concealment of which gives us considerable advantages in our power struggles. So, 
here's how to stamp out creativity in the rest of the organization and get a bit of respect going. <laughs> One, allow subordinates no humor. It threatens your self-importance, especially your omniscience. Treat all humor as frivolous or subversive. Because subversive is, of course, what humor will be in your setup, as it's the only way that people can express their opposition. Since if they express it openly, you're down on them like a ton of bricks. So let's get this clear. Blame humor for the resistance that your way of working creates. Then you don't have to blame your way of working. This is important. And I mean that solemnly. Your dignity is no laughing matter. Second, keeping ourselves feeling irreplaceable involves cutting everybody else down to size. So don't miss an opportunity to undermine your employee's confidence. A perfect opportunity comes when you're reviewing work that they've done. Use your authority to zero in immediately on all the things you can find wrong. Never, never balance the negatives with positives. Only criticize, just as your school teachers do. Always remember, praise makes people uppity. Third, demand that people should always be actively doing things. If you catch anybody pondering, accuse them of laziness and or indecision. This is to starve employees of thinking time because that leads to creativity and insurrection. So, demand urgency at all time, use lots of fighting talk and war analogies and establish a permanent atmosphere of stress of breathless anxiety and crises. In a phrase, keep that mode closed. Now, in this way, we no-nonsense types can be sure that the tiny, tiny, microscopic quantity of creativity in our organization will all be ours. But let your vigilance slip for one moment and you could find yourself surrounded by happy, enthusiastic and creative people whom you might never be able completely to control ever again. So be careful. Thank you and good night. Thank you. So um, what we know about uh, research into creative thinking, uh, let's say in this convergent and divergent thinking, is that most of the day we are in this convergent mode. So it's basically a mode where we just can't want to get through with our day. Uh, so this is kind of this to-do list uh, ticking off mode. Uh, and that is something that we do a lot, maybe too much, as grown-ups. So this convergent thinking, I have to do this and this and this, I get this done, da-da-da-da. This is uh, something that gets us through the things we need to do. But it, all, it is a fallback to a pattern that we already know. So it is a fallback to somewhere where we don't really learn. Learning happens in a, in a place where you are open to not knowing what you're going to do. And this is why the idea of uh, serious play is so important. Because uh, game, if you look at any nature film, you see how little animals are learning. You can imagine Nat Geo documentary where there is a tiger mom kind of lazily sleeping in the sun and the kids are just playing and the pups are playing and playing and playing. At some point, the tiger mom gets pissed off, hits somebody, walks away, then they just continue rambling. They are learning through play. Play is a way of learning. Play is not there just because. Play is there because they are simulating something. And why uh, play is so, so important is that it is a very, very, actually, cognitively, a very difficult task. Because in a play mode, you need to take this extremely seriously and at the same time understand that this is a play. So if, uh, if you look at kids playing, when somebody starts taking it too seriously and uh, mixes it up with the reality, then they start fighting. But if someone says, oh, it's just, a it's just a game, I can fly, look at me, I don't care about your rules, it also means that the ga game cannot continue. So being in a play mode means believing two things at the same time. It's the same as humor. Humor also is knowing that there are two possible completely opposite things that could be real. So this is cognitively a very, very, very high skill. And we forget the playfulness as we grow up. And we forget the potential of playfulness. 
and how important this serious play is in order for our brain to start making new connections and start thinking creatively. And uh, in, order to, in order to get through this kind of... Uh, one of the things why this co convergent thinking could be problematic is also the fact that uh, we usually tend to think the very first ideas when we are in the convergent thinking. So when we just want to get through our day, then we actually tend to do things that we already know. So, uh, oh, sorry. Oops. So um, another aspect, uh, oh, another important aspect to the playfulness is time. So one of the things that, that I learned um, when I started teaching, I was so scared when I looked at the schedule and I understood that there is like, I have a four hour lecture and I, and I was like, I have to speak for four hours. <laughs> then I figured out if I make a lot of jokes, they don't notice that I didn't tell them many things. But at some point I understood that um, my task is not to fill a certain number of hours with information. The more I filled it with information, the more confused they got and the less they actually learned. I also understood uh, something which is important here is, of course, uh, time is a factor. So we need to have some time limits. We just, uh, if we don't have any time limits, nothing is going to happen. So it's not, only, it's not so clear that uh, give them more time, they will be more creative. Uh, but it's more about designing the learning process in a way that it gives rise to potential. So I, I learned as I was learning teaching is that most of my teaching is about designing this learning route in a very empathetic way, in trying to understand how it would be interesting for me. And um, one of the things that I experience a lot with film students is that the first ideas are always the same. They're always the same. Especially when it's something, let's say, a very common thing in film is there is a character who stands maybe in the rain and realizes something important. And then all my cinematographers go, oh, camera has to circle, circle around this character like 360 degrees. And uh, they are really, really sure about this idea because it feels so right. It feels so incredibly right. The reason why it feels so right is because they have seen it like a thousand times before. So the reason why first ideas seem so right is because we know them, we recognize them, and it goes like, oh, yeah, yeah, it must be a good idea because we know them. But if we want the learners to go into an uncharted territory, 
where second idea, maybe only half of the people have the same, third, fourth, and fifth idea, you are going to a completely idiosyncratic path where no one can take you, and you will bring back treasures from there who, what no one else can bring. So uh, one of the things that I learned was that I need to design uh, the learning route in a way that I help them to get out of the box and to stay in this playful zone where they take this completely seriously, but at the same time understand that it's a game. Because if it's not the game, then people become afraid of uh, failure. And failure is the most important thing in learning process. I teach my students to embrace failure as much as, much as they can, because uh, there was, I read, um, I, uh, there is a blog uh, f from a, a woman who, has a, a diagnosis that she has a psychopathic brain, but she's, she's not a criminal. She's a very, very, very successful scientist, but the psych psychopathic tra traits are quite common, um, uh, actually much more common than we know. If you have a psychopathic brain, it doesn't mean that you're going to be a criminal. Uh, the criminality might come from childhood exposure, but she's a very successful person, and uh, she uh, was answering some questions in, um, in her blog, and one of the things that uh, her audience asked her was, what do you find the most confusing about neurotypical people? And she said, the most confusing thing is how much they are afraid of failure. So she says, I'm a psychopath, I'm not afraid of failure. I understand that if I fail, I learn better. The more I fail, the better I become. So the more people laugh at me, the better it is for me, because they are giving me information of how to become better. So uh, this uh, fear of failure is something that is so ingrained in this process of becoming part of society, in this process where the creative thinking is being curbed while we grow up, that one of the things that I work with my students most is how to get them into a zone where they embrace failure, when, where they are open to failure, and when, where they are curious about failure. And being in this play mode, I think, is one of the things that allows us the, both the failure and success, because it's a game. Um, Another thing, probably you know both of those, but uh, I'll try to bring them more into my context. Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000-hour uh, theory is something that, uh, of course, there, there is a lot of dispute about it, if it's exactly 10,000 or whatever. I'm not so interested about whether it's 10,000 or 10,005. I'm more interested about uh, the flight hours, that basically whatever we learn, we need to have a certain amount of exposure because we don't learn by looking at slides. Our brain learns through exposure. And there is even a completely direct way of learning which we rarely uh, realize how much we do. And to explain this, I want to bring an example from one of my favorite uh, neuroscientists or uh, scientists who, who popularizes neuroscience, David Eagleman. He talks about this. There is this uh, job called chicken sexing. I'm not going to talk about the ethics of the chicken sexing, I'm just talking about the skill. So the job means that uh, in this big, uh, di uh, in this big uh, chicken farms, there is uh, somebody whose task it is to quickly differentiate between male and female chicks. So basically there is like a river of little chicks flowing in and there is somebody who just does it. Okay, male, female, male, female. Females go to, males go to soup. Uh, anyways, not talking about the ethics, just about the skill. So most of the chicken sexers are unable to explain how they differentiate between male and female. They just do it. They say, I know, I know, but I can't teach it. I don't know how to do it. So there is, in Japan, there is even a school called Nippon School of Chicken Sexing where they teach this thing, and they teach it without teaching because they only teach it through exposure. A similar thing happened um, during the Second World War in the UK. There was an extreme need uh, for plane spotters. So uh, they were looking for people who are able to differentiate the allied uh, planes from very far. And th there are people who are just very curious about plane spotting. So they gathered a number of people who were good at plane spotting and they tried to ask them to train new plane spotters. But again, they were unable to explain how they are able to say which plane it is. So both uh, uh, solutions to both problems were that if you're a learner in chicken sexing, what you do is you stand next to the professional who is doing it and you look at them doing this. You look at this 
for weeks and weeks until suddenly you start seeing. And you're like, oh, okay, okay, that was a male, that was a female. And at some point when this skill appears slowly because of your brain's exposure, then the learner says, okay, I think I, I, think I started, I think I know it. They replace and the learner starts doing it and the teacher is standing next and is just giving direct feedback. Like, okay, correct, not correct, not. <coughs> so basically there is no words, maybe a yes and no. It's just exposure, pure exposure, because our brain was here way, way, way before words came. So uh, I'll just jump through this quickly. What I want to do in the little time we have tonight is to share with you something, an idea, uh, some knowledge that has been the most important thing in my entire life. And an idea that has me totally frustrated and incredibly optimistic at the same time about the future. So to get started, what I would like to do is to, uh, this is going to be a short presentation, don't get scared. <laughs> <laughs> but let's start out with the last two million years. And what I've done to make that a little easier to grasp in the time we have is to condense that two million years into one calendar year, just to give us some perspective about where we're going. So we're going to take that two million years and look at it as one calendar year. And I'll start at the beginning. About two million years ago, give or take a million, the first humans took steps, became bipedal, started to move around in a different way, and began the human journey. January 1, the Stone Age. We spent quite a bit of time hunting and gathering, and it was not until November the 19th that we discovered fire that we could control, heat our homes, cook our food, protect us from predators. But by December the 29th, agriculture had been invented. And all of a sudden, cities emerged and people living together and sharing and collaborating. That was a very incredible invention of people, agriculture, on December 29th of that calendar year. On December the 31st was Rome, Greece, the advent of the idea of science, of replicatable knowledge, that somebody could investigate something that nature did, understand it, and then take that knowledge and put it to human use. Big idea, because we at that point could move to 1105. <laughs> because now people started to gather together and apply those ideas in a mass way. And uh, they could replicate the results of these ideas. And a very important part of the science idea itself is to find something and then be able to repeat it in a very predictable way. That was critical. And of course, we had to, uh, since we're building a lot of these factories, we had to build factories for human beings too, called schools so we could manufacture people that could work well in the factories. And that was an extraordinary and important idea because starting at 11.05, in the last few minutes, all hell broke loose. And we have moved in such a, a fantastic way during that period. In those last few minutes, think about the, just 100 years ago, most people living in America lived in poverty. Very few people had indoor plumbing. Very few people had electricity. In the last hundred years, in the last few minutes of that calendar year, it's incredible what has happened during this period. And that has produced so much progress that we have now turned success into failure. Now that, in, that knowledge has spread itself all over the world and people are pushing up against each other a little bit in the sense that a third world country can do just as well producing something as we can. And that produces a problem. And we're, we're now facing a period in history where no institution is not facing profound, turbulent, unpredictable change. 
and that's everywhere in the world. So what do we do? Because we have all these old answers, but they don't seem to be working the way they used to. Well, a few years ago, about 60 of the leaders in industry in America got together and started a study to say, okay, with this new kind of world that we have, with the internet, with all the satellite communication, with telephony, there are many more telephones in the world than there are people at this point. Uh, what does America do? And I won't try to go through the whole study, but they, the result was they said there's only one possibility for us to succeed as Americans to be competitive, and that is to innovate, and to innovate continuously. And that's really what I want to share, because we have been looking at what it is that's behind that process of innovation, creative thinking, what we can do with our brains, what is that, the possibilities of that resource that we all have in these heads of ours. Uh, the thing that changed everything for us in trying to understand creativity is that somebody from NASA came to us, the deputy director, and said, look, we have a lot of people working for us. We need some way to select the people that are the most creative so they can go on the teams that are facing the toughest problems. Can you give us a, some kind of an instrument, a test or something that we can give to find those people? Uh, we didn't have such a thing, but we developed it, uh, we applied it, and it, it was very predictive. It worked really well. But the idea emerged that, gee, uh, we still don't know where creativity comes from. Is it that some people are born with it and others not? Or is it learned? Does it come from our experience in life? And the idea came up, this, this test is so simple. Why don't we give it to some children and see how they do? So we did. We, we created a, a sample of the American population with 1,600 children. And started it out when they were about five years old. Now here's a question I want to ask you. This is a test for the ability to look at a problem and come up with new, different, and innovative ideas. What percentage of those five-year-olds fell into what you might call the genius category of imagination? 80, 90, wow. This is a great audience. <laughs> There are some audiences that don't guess quite that high. 98%. We were pretty shocked. Some people like you would probably not be shocked. You probably, <laughs> I suspect you've been five-year-olds, so there you are. But, the, you know, the information was so astonishing, we decided to turn that into a longitudinal study, go back five years later and see how they do it. So we went back, they're now 10. What would you guess? Somebody came on very close. 30%. We decided to extend it for five more years. They're now 15. Well, we have some pessimists out there. It was all the way up to 12. So you can see something of a trend here, right? That, that study ended because so many people got depressed. <laughs> Most of the testing was done by teachers and they just didn't want to do it again. But we have tested a lot of adults. And what would you guess? You're close. 2%. Now the great historian Oswald uh, Spengler uh, once said in the, all of his years of studying history he had concluded it only takes 2% of a population to create the basic ideas and that everybody else applies them. And it turned out, gee, he was pretty close to right. <laughs> Look, folks, if we're going to enter the future with hope, that's not going to work. We have to do something about it. And what we found with those children was the thing that I want to try to share with you and hope that you walk out of here tonight knowing why that happened and what you can do about it because you have the possibility of being in that 98% tomorrow. And I'm serious about that. What we found from the studies with children and from looking at the way brains work, that we can actually do that, there are two kinds of thinking that occur in the brain and they use different parts of the brain 
And it's a totally different paradigm in the sense of how we form something in our minds. One is called divergent, that's imagination. That's generating new possibilities, and the other is called convergent. And that's where you're making a judgment, you're making a, a decision, you're testing something, you're criticizing, you're evaluating. So one is like an accelerator and the other one is like the brake. We found that what happens to these children as we educate them is we teach them to do both kinds of thinking at the same time. So when somebody asks you to come up with new ideas, as you come up with them, what we've mostly learned in school is to start looking at them immediately and trying to say, oh, well, you can hear the stuff that goes on. We've done that before, we've never done that, that's crazy, that'll cost too much, all of that. When you actually look at what's happening inside the brain, you find that neurons are fighting each other and actually diminishing the power of the brain because we're constantly judging, criticizing, etc. This is not gonna work, folks. You need to find the five-year-old, and you can. That capability never goes away. That part of the brain that produces this wonderful imagination is something that you exercise every day when you're dreaming. So the great designer said, you know, I'm gonna put that mechanism so they exercise it every day in case they ever need an idea. <laughs> You've got that capability, absolutely. And you'll move from the normal brain, which is that colored area shows normal thinking, to a brain that is very active everywhere, particularly in the front. So it gets worse because if we're operating under fear, we're using even a smaller part of the brain. And as we begin to use logic, we use more, but we begin to use creative thinking and the brain lights up. It's just extraordinary what happens. And nature does this as well, we found, that evolution works that way, producing many alternatives then through natural selection, selecting the best ones. But it's always creating a lot of possibilities before it starts selecting. So the, the question we face for the future is, are we going to be in a culture that depends on right answers, that are repeatable, that are always predictable? Or are we going to have a culture where whatever it is we're thinking about, a new recipe or a spaceship, are there many possibilities? Can we create a new future that solves the new problems that, that we have never seen before? So Einstein was right, and your issue is to go beyond the first step that we took <laughs> and take the first leap and turn your five-year-old on to tap into that imagination that every one of you has that can make the future extraordinarily brighter for everybody. Tomorrow, do an exercise. Pick up a table fork, turn your five-year-old on, and come up with 25 or 30 ideas on how to improve let that five-year-old figure out ideas on how to improve that table fork. You can begin that exercise, and like anything else, you can start exercising that part of the brain and turn yourself into a great innovator of the wonderful future we can have if we start doing this. Thank you. So those last few minutes uh, is something that um, is something that uh, maybe uh, is the basis of most of the struggles that we have in our educational system, at least this is what I, I have experienced, is that um, we tend to forget how long time our brains evolved in a very specific way and how little time this contemporary society has existed. The brains that we have evolved most of the time way before words and obviously way, way before PowerPoint slides. <laughs> so the way we learn will not uh, change during this couple of last minutes of that year. The way we learn is still the same as it was when we were prehistoric. So uh, w this part of learning through exposure is something that I think uh, especially in, um, in planning teaching is something that often is missed. So we kind of think like, how much time does it take to tell them the thing? 
So it will take me one hour to tell them the thing, so it obviously it takes one hour to learn it. But obviously it's not so. Actually, in order to learn something, the time that it takes is completely different and the process that it takes is completely different. And the part of this um, uh, learning, why it, uh, this, uh, uh, these 10,000 hours are so important, Actually, I'll, I'll come back to the 10,000 hours in a minute. But first, I will speak a little bit about flow. You probably are all aware about the flow theory, but, uh, but I, I, will, um, I will touch upon it a little bit because it is part of, uh, of designing uh, a certain environment for learning where your skills, but also the challenge, match each other. Flow theory in less than five minutes, I promise. It was the first game of the 1992 NBA Championship Series. The Portland Trailblazers were pulling ahead of the Chicago Bulls when Phil Jackson called a timeout. Michael Jordan emerged from this timeout with a sense of intense concentration. And though it didn't seem like a big deal at the time, he would then go on in the next 18 minutes to hit six three-pointers. At one point, he looked to the sidelines and shrugged his shoulders, seemingly surprised by his own success. He later described this experience as being in the zone. Now, players in every sport describe this similar experience of being in the zone, where they tune out the crowd and the noise and the distractions and just play at their top performance. But it isn't limited to sports. Artists and authors, musicians, engineers, composers, they all experience this same sense of being in the zone. It's a strange paradox where time seems to stand still and yet it seems to be over in an instant. It feels effortless even though you're facing an extreme challenge. There's a sense of relaxation, but it's also intense. You seem more present than ever, but you also seem to lose your entire sense of self. You've probably experienced this before, when you were so engaged in a task that you lost track of time and place. There is a term for this. It's called being in a state of flow. And if we want students to be fully empowered, to own the creative process, to engage in deep and meaningful work, well, then we need to understand what it means for students to reach this state of flow. Although the idea of flow has existed for thousands of years, flow theory began in the 1970s and 80s when Hungarian psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi became fascinated by artists who were so lost in their creative work that they would lose track of time and even ignore food, water, and sleep. And through his research, he noticed a similar experience with scientists and athletes and authors and all kinds of people who engaged in meaningful work. It was a state of hyper-focus and complete engagement, and he described it as optimal experience. Researchers do not have one single working model for flow theory, but there are a few factors that um, the theorists have described as being vital for achieving the state of flow. Number one, it needs to be a task that you find intrinsically rewarding. You're not gonna hit a state of flow while necessarily you know, mowing the yard or cleaning toilets, unless that's your jam. Number two, you need clear goals and a sense of progress. It helps if you are actually setting the goals yourself. Number three, the task needs clear and immediate feedback. You need to know what you're doing and where you're going. Number four, the challenge must match the perceived skills. This requires a sense of personal control or agency over the task. In 1987, uh, researchers published the eight channel model of flow shown here. And notice that if a task is too easy, you might experience apathy or boredom, but if a task seems too hard, you'll be anxious. The goal is to match both the skill level and the task at hand. And number five, it requires intense focus on the present moment. So what does this actually mean for schools? Well, here are a few ideas. Number one, tap into intrinsic motivation. Find tasks that students will want to do rather than tasks that they simply have to do. Number two, embrace student choice and agency. 
whenever possible, allow them to own their learning. Number three, provide the right scaffolding so that students can match the challenge level to their ability levels, or at least their perceived ability levels. Number four, minimize distractions so that students can focus on their learning. It helps to change the pacing so that you have fewer tasks and more time to accomplish it. And number five, help students learn to monitor their own progress through metacognition. Teach them to set goals, analyze tasks, figure out what they need to do, make adjustments in the moment, and reflect on their progress at hand. Uh, one of the things why this uh, flow model has been so important uh, for me in my teaching is that in my field uh, there, are m there is a number of specializations that uh, experience this flow um, during their professional lives a lot. For example, film editors, uh, have um, uh, they, many of them describe a complete sense of loss of themselves. So why uh, it uh, is important or interesting is that uh, Below here you can see the, the skill level and on the left you can see the challenge level. So if we are somewhere here, uh, down here, our skills are low and the challenge is low, we are quite apathetic towards the task. If the skill level goes up but the challenge still remains low, we can be bored or at some point quite relaxed. At the same time on this scale, if uh, the challenge goes up and our skills are still low, then we go into worry and anxiety. So imagine, let's say, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm somebody who wants to, I don't know, become an opera singer. And at home everybody says, oh, you're so, so good at singing. <coughs> so I could be in an entrance exam to the, academy, to the music academy completely super stressed because my challenge level is very, very high. At the same time, singing the exact same song at my grandma's uh, birthday, I could be quite relaxed because the challenge level is low. I know she's going to like me anyway. So the same thing, the same song can create different aspects of arousal or, or boredom. And here, when our skill level is already very high and the challenge level is also quite high, then we experience this uh, sense of flow. And the people who become more and more skilled, the challenge level needs to be up because they don't, it's not so interesting for them. So in order to get into a sense of flow, the more your skills raise, the more uh, the challenge should, should raise in a way. And the people who are active, uh, proactive learners, they are able to seek the challenge themselves. But um, if we build systems where people kind of should move forward, we should keep them interested, we should keep them uh, in the state of flow, uh, there is a need to look at this uh, systematically. And one of the ways that I had done it in my curriculum is I saw the curriculum as a spiral. It's not that I have peace and peace and peace and peace. It is a spiral where we keep returning to the same thing, but the challenge is going up and up and up. So there is a possibility. Uh, and coming back to my uh, experience as, uh, as a driving novice is that I mostly drive with automatic but sometimes I, I drive with, with gear and, uh, and when, I, when, I, uh, when I do this when I sit into the car I still go like dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so I still need to do some kind of little brain gymnastics and then I can drive but it's not an automatic skill yet so as, as you probably know these uh, four stages of learning something uh, is something that I experience on a daily basis with my students. So the first uh, level of learning is something that is called uh, unconscious incompetence. So unconscious incompetence usually, in my film school students, it usually lasts from uh, entrance exams, once they get the news that they got in, to the, like, the first two days in school. So they're really happy, they are not aware of what they don't know, and it's very good. So you just, it's, it's the moment where you enter the course. You sit down, you're like, okay, let's do this. It shouldn't be complicated. You look at the notes, okay, so we're going to go through this, and in the evening I will know all of this. And then, of course, comes the next stage, which is known as conscious incompetence, which is a very, very hard place to be because you're suddenly aware of everything that you don't know. And our students, uh, my students, they have this for sometimes for two or three, three years even. The awareness of what I don't know just keeps on growing and growing and growing. And along with this, uh, people become insecure because it's a very, very insecure place to be. 
So one of the things that I do a lot with my students is to explain them how people learn and to also explain them that the fact that you feel uncomfortable, that means that you're learning. So if you feel comfortable, you're not learning, you're doing something that you already know. So the fact that you are in an uncomfortable zone, it actually is a definition of learning. So I teach them to embrace this uh, discomfort. Because very often uh, what we do in teaching systems is that it, learners feel discomfort, they start complaining and we get panicked and we start changing the system. But very often this discomfort is not because of the system is wrong, it's because the student has entered a learning stage and they really just need help in getting through this discomfort. Because the next stage after this is something that is called conscious competence. So this means that you already more or less know the things, you're not fully, it's not fully automatic yet. This is me driving shift gear, I'm going, okay, I can do this. Um, and the very last stage is known as, as unconscious competence, where it has become automatic, you don't really realize that you ever learned it. And this is usually the phase where we find the driving teachers. And the funny thing is with driving teachers is that they drive very well. And uh, driving schools think that obviously if they drive very well, then it means that they also teach well, which absolutely is not the case. Usually the better they drive, the worse they teach. Because when you're doing something very well, the stupid learner next to you just pisses you off. What's wrong with you? I told you, it's so easy, it's so intuitive. How can it be so complicated? And you know, with driving teachers, the problem is that these stupid people, they just keep on coming. Years and years, for 20 years, you tell them how to drive and they still don't know how to drive. It's very frustrating. It, it just like, it feels like 20 years of wasted time because they still don't know how to drive. So in order to be able to support somebody who is in this conscious incompetence phase, when you yourself are in a fully uh, unconscious competence, is, is very hard. It, it takes, it, it, it takes uh, empathy. It also needs you to understand that there was a time where I didn't know how it feels like and it was complicated. Because we forget it. This is the way learning works. We forget how hard it was because otherwise we wouldn't. If women here who have had children, if we wouldn't forget how hard it is, we would never have a second child. So part of learning is forgetting. We always forget things because we need to forget it because uh, if we carry it along too much, then it means we can't learn new things. So, so one of the things that, uh, and, and very often also I experience, especially in film schools, uh, uh, we sometimes invite some big, big filmmakers who come to the school and they go like, they are in this unconscious, uh, unconscious competence phase and they go like, oh, you have all of this in you. You're wasting your time here in school. I just started doing, just start doing. All of this is here. Trust your guts, da, da, da. And the teachers, like regular teachers, are, <laughs> how I'm gonna get through with this? Because usually when this professional leaves, then the students are looking at them like, why are we learning if it's so intuitive? <laughs> but the fact that something has become automatic makes it feel like intuitive. Kahneman says that intuition is pattern recognition. So if you're exposed to something long enough, uh, your brain learns it and it starts feeling like intuition. But it's really a skill that you have learned. Up until vision, we learn seeing when we're born, we start learning seeing. The reason why little babies don't see is not that they don't have the optics for it. It's just they are learning to see. So, um, so one of the things that, that I really, really kind of feel important in, in any kind of teaching is the more you feel like you know it, the more you need to exercise your empathy to understand how hard uh, it feels like not to know it. And that they really keep on being stupid after 20 years of working, new people come in and they still don't know. So the, so the last uh, bit I want to leave you with is, um, uh -huh, is this. So this 10,000 hours theory, here, what you can see, there are two neurons, myelinated and non-myelinated neuron. So basically what happens when your brain learns something is uh, not so much about building new network, brain networks, it's about building myelin. And myelin is, is like isolation material. These are basically electrical <laughs> signals. And the more your brain 
knows that I need to use this parts of my brain, the more it builds myelin around it. So in a way, exposure, these flight hours, exposure to something, the, the time that it takes to learn something is the time that it takes for your brain to build, to myelinate, to build a certain amount of myelin around your um, respective brain networks. And it takes time. It, it, is, it is never enough. This process will not start happening by showing slides. It also will not start happening by reading one uh, like compulsory reading. It starts happening through exposure. So, so, so the thing that I maybe um, have learned the most <coughs> during this uh, uh, learning to teach has been that um, I need to give my students exposure to something. I need to accept that it comes with discomfort. I need to not only accept it, but to embrace the discomfort. And they need to find a way to keep them remembering that it's a game. It's a very, very serious, but it's a game. Because this allows them to use their own potential in ways that uh, otherwise they couldn't. Uh, and maybe last but not least, is that uh, we, we, we are here, like the current uh, paradigm in teaching is a, is a learner-centered teaching. And learner-centered teaching, uh, very often when I read about it, it says that the responsibility, that the learner bears the, the responsibility, which in a way I agree with this, but I think this wording is very precarious. It's dangerous to say that the learner bears the responsibility for learning because it's very easy to just leave them alone. So my understanding of uh, contemporary teaching is, um, is that uh, obviously I am not uh, a monopoly of information. My students are so much better technologically than I am by now. I am, in, like in their terms, I'm only 42, I think. <laughs> in their terms, I'm a dinosaur. So in their terms, in terms of technology, I am so, so, so behind of everything that I don't have any authority to tell them how to save files or how to use whatever technological solutions that we need to use in the film industry. And I don't even try because I don't see that my job is uh, to be a monopoly of information. My job is there that I would say, I don't think that I'm smarter than my students or better than my students. The only difference I see is that I was here first. So it was kind of, I'm here. I'm like, okay, I figured this out. Then we're like, go, 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 come, 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 come. So I think this goes like this, this goes like this. And this is how I see it. Um, I was here first. So it's the only difference between me and them is, the, is maybe the birth year. But if you're teaching grown-ups, then it also could be not birth year. It's just the fact that I was in this room first. But... Uh, um, if, I, if I see it like this, it takes away also the pressure of, of knowing everything because I think there is an incredible pressure of that we feel that we need to know everything in order to, to start teaching. But the, this openness, uh, uh, embracing a failure and this understanding that it is a very serious game is something that also helps me as a teacher because I don't take myself too seriously as you maybe noticed. I promise that I will leave some time for questions and it's like... Four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>